So, a lot of people think gravity and quantum mechanics will someday be combined into one unified theory. And since gravitation is based on geometry, then that would mean that there should be some geometric analog for quantum mechanics. So I asked a very simple question. How do we make a small atomic-sized particle in geometry? And the answer I came up with is based on surface tension. A lot of people hear surface tension and they think of chemistry, but surface tension is actually rooted in statistical thermodynamics. So if we have a continuum and we draw a plane through the middle of this continuum, could be of anything, then we define a state S1 of existence above this plane and a state S2 below the plane. If we eliminate state S1 or we make it inaccessible, that creates a surface between these two states. And the only way you can have this higher order is by reducing multiplicity. The probability of S2 becomes larger. Reduction in multiplicity means a decrease in entropy and requires work. We call this work of formation of a surface, the surface energy. So you see, all it takes to have surface energy is a surface between two states. The other principle of physical chemistry of surfaces is that surface energy is the same thing as surface tension. I'll demonstrate this with this little simple mechanical model. Um, if you have a surface stretched across this wireframe with one movable side, and the surface has an energy density I'm going to call Greek letter kappa, then when we move one of the sides, creating some additional surface area, the work done is simply kappa times the change in area. We can rewrite this differential area as length times the distance that the side moved, which is kappa LDX. If we want to find the force required to pull on the surface this distance, we remember that work is just force times distance. So the distance it moved was dx, right? So dx is going to fall out from both sides of the equation, and you're left with force equals kappa L. Well, L is length. That means that kappa has units of force per length. So we find that surface tension is exactly the same thing as surface energy. So why do I think space-time has surface tension? It should be self-evident. If I asked you to prepare a plot of everything in this room on a space-time diagram, it would look like this. All observers plot the location of things in space according to their own uh, perceived time, so their own coordinate of time. So we live in hypersurfaces of time where everything is organized on the surface. And I say that thermodynamically, if everything is organized on a surface, it must have surface tension. So if we pull out a little element of hypersurface, by the way, you could have plotted this against any two coordinates of space and one coordinate of time. So it's actually a three surface in a four dimensional space, but it doesn't matter. Dimensionality doesn't matter for surface tension to exist. This little element would have stresses in all spatial directions according to thermodynamics. So the stress energy tensor should actually look like this. It shouldn't just have a mass term, but it should have three negative terms in the, on the spatial diagonal indicating surface tension. So I said I want to figure out what a particle would look like with this surface tension. So how would this membrane of space-time evolve? And if you can do this in Lorentzian geometry, but it's very challenging. And I come from a mechanics background, so there's the whole field of Lorentzian geometry evolved using a pseudo-Ramanian metric. Well, at the same time, this other mathematics was evolving called continuum mechanics, which uses a regular Ramanian metric in a positive definite metric. And um, so all we need to do to switch from Lorentzian geometry to continuum mechanics is make a simple coordinate substitution where we change the coordinate of time, we make it imaginary, and <clears throat> proper time, we make imaginary. So with these two coordinate changes, we can work in the field of continuum mechanics to see how this little element would evolve in time. And we write our equation of motion for that, we get this tensor equation, which I don't have time to go through everything, but this first tensor is basically the gradient of the stress energy across this little element. The second term that it's equated to is simply 
the derivative of the four vector velocity of this little element with respect to the observer, um, taking this partial derivative with respect to proper time. And then you get this temperature uh, tensor as well. So this is just the most complicated way I could write F equals MA. The other thing you can do in mechanics is you can write a deformation tensor. It's called the rate of deformation tensor. It's a two-point tensor. It has two legs. One leg is in the, the time that you took the first observation. The second leg is in the time where you take your second observation. And it relates how space-time evolves across this differential unit of space-time. And it has to do with how it stretches and strains, whereas the prior equation was how it moves. Okay. And then the last thing you do in mechanics is you write a constitutive relation, which relates the stress-energy tensor to reconfiguration. In physics, this is called the coupling constant. And so in general relativity, it would just be Einstein's constant, right? A lot of relativists think that this is the only solution. But in continuum mechanics, we know that there's an entire set of solutions of anisotropic coupling tensors that satisfy uh, differential geometry, smooth manifolds, but it can't be just any old tensor. There are specific rules. It has to be invertible, and it has to have a positive determinant greater than zero. This makes it orthonormal and satisfies all the uh, conditions of smooth manifolds, okay? The other thing we can do, by, by the way, this would be a four by four by four by four tensor with 264 terms which is a little unwieldy. But we can implement a number of symmetries like conservation of momentum, conservation of linear momentum, and conservation of mass to kind of pare it down. And we get this beautiful, sexy tensor that looks like this. So you have Planck's constant on the outside of the tensor, and then you have one over the surface area of a sphere with Planck length as the radius. Why? I have no idea. This is just how it works out when you impose certain boundary conditions. And if you take these two terms, Planck's constant times the speed of light times this, you get the inverse of the Einstein constant. So when we plug it in here and move it over to the other side, you get pretty much the equation of general relativity at slow speeds. The other thing to note is that the determinant of this tensor is also this same constant, Einstein, the inverse of the Einstein constant. So that, the determinant has to do with scaling. So this tensor will scale the same way as general relativity, but we get these Planck's constant times the spatial terms, which is what gives us this interesting surface tension-like behavior where we can create small particles. If you don't believe that continuum mechanics has anything to do with general relativity, I'm going to bring you back to this two-point tensor rate of deformation. Don't worry about all of this. We can write it in index notation, and it looks like this. The first portion has to do with strain or how the element stretches and how its volume changes. The second one <coughs> term has to do with the curviness of this. So we can rewrite that. We know in mechanics that this first part is the push forward of the Lie derivative of the metric. And the second part is actually the Gaussian curvature. We can multiply through by the metric with two covariant components. And we end up getting the rate of deformation with two covariant components, which is called the first term, when you multiply through by G with two covariant components, is called the um, three-dimensional extrinsic curvature. And the second term is the Gaussian curvature times the metric. This whole thing is just Einstein's tensor in three plus one space. So what do the particles look like that get created by making these manipulations to space-time? Well, what's interesting is the zero, zero term in the rate of def in the in the equations of motion, the wave equation looks like this. So we have a particle that have to, has to do with the observer's coordinate of time wiggling. And it looks like a Klein-Gordon equation, so it carries no mass, and it, all the waves move at the speed of light. The second interesting an uh, an analogy with quantum mechanics comes from the spatial terms of the equation of motion, and it looks like the Schrodinger equation. So we essentially have mass and stretching moving through space-time. So the metric is, is, is moving according to Schrodinger's equation. The Planck's constant came into this through my anisotropic uh, coupling tensor. 
the uh, imaginary I came when I went from my complex coordinates that I'm working in and went back to natural units, the I popped out. And so it's kind of interesting to me that mass moves through this model in accordance with the Schrodinger-like equation. So we get Schrodinger-type particles. And then you also get some wild-type particles from uh, the, def the, uh, the off-diagonal terms in the strain tensor have to be set equal to zero. This is the equation for vortices in this me membrane, in this metric, okay? And the last thing which I find very interesting is the constitutive relationship itself is the stress energy for the spatial terms divided by the rate of deformation tensor was equal to this, right? Well, the units of this are energy, and the units of rate of deformation are one over proper time. So you basically have energy times proper time is related to the Planck's constant. This I popped up when I converted back to natural units. If we square both sides, we get this. If we employ the Schwartz inequality, recognizing that these are both vectors, you get essentially something that looks a lot like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is the elasticity of space-time with this anisotropic coupling constant quantizing space-time according to Planck's constant. So, in summary, what I've done is I took an observation in some, mem in some uh, manifold. And I said if you take a second observation, the manifold changes and it's separated by this distance d tau, which is a scalar mapping between the two observation manifolds. We can boost up to the tangent uh, frame at any point. And the evolution of that tangent point is this rate of deformation tensor. This is pretty much the mechanics that I've done. And so the, four, the, the takeaways that I'd like you to have is thermodynamics tells us we should have negative terms in the stress energy tensor. Number two, the only solution the only solution to Einstein's equations is not a scalar, but you can mess around with different anisotropic tensors, uh, coupling tensors. And number three, when you put that all together, you, get, you can create small particles of curled up space-time that behave somewhat similar to quantum mechanics. So is this a real quantum mechanics? We need to do more work on this, but I think it's very interesting you make these small changes to Einstein's equations and you can get a particle of atomic scale. Thank you.